This is Mike Hazelton from the School of Nursing and Midwifery at the University and I'm presenting the week three lecture on ethnographic research for the course HLSC 4120. Let's start with origins and definitions uh, of the term ethnography. If, uh, the Greek uh, derivation for ethnos, custom, culture, group, uh, they're the literal meanings, and in Latin, graphia, drawing, writing, or description. So literally, ethnography means the writing of culture or writing culture. Probably ethnography is best approached initially as a style of research, a style of qualitative research, aiming to understand the activities and meanings of particular groups, rather than as an approach to data collection. As with most forms of research, of course, data collection is a component of a much broader research approach. So what we're really aiming to do with ethnography is to study human behaviour in its cultural context. Ethnography has sometimes been referred to as interpretive research. That is, the approach is primarily about the interpretation of culture via the use of direct observation, which might involve observation of people, which could also take into account the design and layout of buildings and other environmental settings, how people move around buildings, how they move around settings, uh, the patterns of interaction, what people say, what they do, uh, and the context within which they do it. This is all very much the stuff of ethnography. Uh, other uh, uh, aspects of interpretation, other things with which an ethnographer would pay very careful attention would include interviews, and sometimes there can be documentary examination as well to look at, for instance, policy documents, uh, written protocols that might give us insights into why people do things in certain ways, or even the extent to which we might expect they would do things according to a policy or a protocol, but perhaps might also deviate from that. So to further expand on origins, really the beginnings of ethnography as we know it today, we probably need to go back to the end of the 19th century or the very first few decades of the 20th century. And if you look back over that early work, you'll see the names of people such as Malinowski and particularly Margaret Mead feature heavily. These people were anthropologists and ethnography really was the research approach that developed initially within the discipline of anthropology but has been picked up in other disciplines such as sociology and more recently educational research and of course health research, our own disciplinary areas. Uh, talking about people such as Margaret Mead, Margaret Mead's work undertaken in the early decades of the 20th century involved the study of cultural patterns and norms, that is rules, of, of, of various usually non-Western cultures. She and, and her colleagues at that time were particularly interested to study the cultures of what were seen to be primitive, that is non-Western non cultures, often in places such as the Pacific Islands, um, in Australia, uh, in Papua New Guinea, uh, in those parts of the world that we now uh, would, would think of as, say, Indonesia or Malaysia. Uh, and a large part of the reason that these researchers were interested in studying these cultures was really uh, to do with an expectation that perhaps what they were doing was recording vanishing cultures. These cultures would vanish over time through the impact of modernisation. We now know, of course, that uh, that's not correct and many of these so-called primitive cultures, as they were seen at that stage, have proven to be extremely resilient in the face uh, of Western-style modernisation. So that's probably one way of characterising the kind of ethnographic research broadly undertaken up until the Second World War. After the Second World War, in that post-war period of, of optimism and the expectation of rebuilding uh, a, a, a world that was uh, much more democratic, if you like, much more liberal in its thinking, where people would be able to uh, have uh, the benefit of many, many more life opportunities, both within the Western world but also in other parts of the uh, so-called developing world, um, 
the work of ethnographers turned increasingly in the direction of studying cultures within their own, usually Western societies. Uh, and, and in this sense, you saw people in North America from what is sometimes called the Chicago School starting to study, uh, if you like, the culture uh, that they felt existed w within marginalised groups. So they started undertaking ethnographic research, research into the culture that they believed existed uh, in slum areas amongst marginal groups or groups deemed to be dangerous. Um, and in particular, they were interested in looking at uh, problems associated with how do you maintain social order, how do you address, address specific problems uh, such as, um, for instance, um, unemployment, uh, high levels of unemployment, or, or groups who are uh, from the, the perceived lower classes uh, where there were educational difficulties which led into uh, difficulties with gaining ongoing employment. Uh, marginalised groups, later on people seen to be heavy users of drug, drugs and alcohol, groups that might have been seen to pose, if you like, uh, 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 threats to the social order uh, through social patterns involving delinquency, uh, law breaking and those sorts of social issues. So we can consider that culture is a key unit of analysis in terms of ethnography as a research approach. And culture in this context can be understood as knowledge learned, shared and understood by members of a social group so that interactions and behaviours can be interpreted and understood by the members of that group. So if we look at that as a broad background to ethnographic research, let's move now more specifically to our area, our specific area of interest, which is why ethnography, why ethnographic research, why should we use this kind of research approach in addressing problems within health uh, and health services. Um, a good example, for instance, might be, and it might be better to talk about a specific example rather than to talk generalities at this stage, if you think of the recent Garling report in New South Wales, and Commissioner Garling uh, was charged to undertake a comprehensive inquiry into acute hospital services in New South Wales, and in that he found that to a considerable extent failures in service delivery can be attributed to organisational culture. In very broad terms, what Garling has argued in his comprehensive report is that in the in acute care services in New South Wales, by and large, health professionals, and he's talking here really about doctors, nurses and allied health professionals, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that collectively we're guilty of perhaps being rather more concerned about our own needs rather than the needs of those for whom we're supposed to be providing care and treatment, our patients, our clients, our consumers. He goes on to argue that reforming this culture is one of the most pressing challenges facing health policy makers and service planners in this state. And I think it would be fair to say that in other states these would be the kinds of issues that would also be very much exercising the minds of health policy reformers. I'm sure New South Wales isn't alone uh, in this whole area. So where ethno ethnography would come into this would be that if, if someone like Commissioner Garling is arguing that we need to better understand the nature of the organisational culture that operates through New South Wales acute care hospitals, one of the ways in which we might better understand this would be through uh, undertaking research using uh, research approaches that have been designed to enable us to develop better understandings of culture. And of course ethnography is par excellence, one of those approaches. Um, and to the extent to which what is implied in Garling's recommendations is the need for substantial culture change, ethnography has the potential to be a research approach that could be used to enable us to better inform the direction that that culture change might take and indeed possibly even to evaluate whether or not it's being effective uh, over an extended period of time. So I'll come back to that later on in the lecture, but that's just to give you an idea of how at the policy level at least ethnography might be useful in health policy research and of course to the extent to which health policy research is is about trying to better understand what happens at the day-to-day -day level 
involving health professionals such as doctors, nurses and allied, uh, allied health professionals. Uh, it can be taken down to the service delivery level, to the specific clinical unit level, even to the individual, even to the level of individuals if we choose to do that. Ethnographic approaches can be used at all of those levels, from the broad organisational level right down to the unit or even individual health professional level. Now one of the things we need to note in respect of ethnography is that there are at least two competing traditions. So in that sense I've entitled this slide Two Minds About Ethnography. We can talk of doing ethnography and this could be said as using the methods and procedures of ethnography to study a culture and we can also talk about writing ethnography that is producing a written account or text of one's interpretation of that culture. The point I'm wanting to make here is that we can use, to some extent, ethnographic methods across a broad range of qualitative research approaches without necessarily producing, in broad terms, an ethnography as such. So there are ethnographic methods and there is ethnography. Now I know that sounds a little bit confusing, perhaps I'll be able to clarify that as we get further uh, into uh, of the lecture. It's important to note also that some of the texts that have been written for nurses, midwives and other health professionals suggest that health professions use ethnography differently to the ways in which anthropologists and other social scientists use it. In some ways I agree with this but would not want to push the point too far. Essentially the point that's being made here is that by attempting to bend the use of ethnographic approaches, research approaches to specific health, health policy or clinical problems, perhaps we're starting to use those approaches in ways that differ, uh, perhaps even to, to a reasonable extent, um, from the ways in which they might be used by anthropologists or, 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 or sociologists who are working more from, if you like, a pure social scientific perspective. Again, I'm not absolutely sure about that, um, but maybe that's something we need to bear in mind. Perhaps we're actually modifying the nature of the methodology by using it specifically in relation to health research problems. And again, following on from the previous slide, there are two broad types of ethnography that you're going to see referred to in the literature. Um, and this would be true across each of the health disciplines, probably more so for nursing, but I, I believe for those of you from uh, professions such as social work, occupational therapy, um, uh, uh, psychology and, and, and any of the other allied health professions, I think you might start increasingly to see the critical version of ethnography being used in your literature as well. So two broad types. One is generally uh, described as descriptive or referred to as descriptive or conventional ethnography and this really provides for the description of cultures or groups and the aim is to uncover patterns or cultural categories or broad themes if you like uh, within a culture as expressed by particular uh, groups of people. And what differentiates this approach from the next one that I'll speak about in a moment is that it lacks what I would refer to as an explicitly ideologically, uh, ideological or political intent. Uh, in other words, in a sense it's uh, it sets out to describe or to observe patterns that are seen from a cultural point of view that are seen to be expressed by the groups that are being studied and really the aim to describe these patterns is really what is being pursued in this approach. Now to try and differentiate that first approach from the second, the critical ethnography, um, might be a little difficult, but uh, what we need to grasp here is that in the second or critical ethnographic approach what you will find is an explicit ideological or political intent. So this second type of critical ethnography, uh, of an ethnography, what is referred to as critical ethnography, uses similar data collection and analysis methods to uh, the conventional or descriptive type, but it has an explicit ideological or political intent. And usually 
the aim of this critical ethnography is to try and free or emancipate what is seen to be an oppressed group from whatever that particular oppression might be. Now, the form of critical ethnography that I'm most familiar with comes from my disciplinary area, which is nursing, and there, is, uh, there has been a series of critical ethnographic studies that have been done over the last 20 to 30 years in nursing, certainly within Australia, but also in a number of other countries which have attempted to, uh, for instance, to identify the ways in which the broad medical establishment operates so as to, uh, if you like, oppress or to hold back the aspirations of the profession of nursing uh, or, or individual groups of nurses. And to the extent to which a critical ethnography of, of nursing um, might try and identify uh, uh, the processes of this oppression and then perhaps to point to ways in which nurses might resist or to undermine what is perceived to be medical dominance or medical uh, oppression. This could be said to be an ideologically uh, a loaded approach which aims to try and emancipate or free nurses from the nature of that oppression. Now, I suspect that if you look at, other, at the literature of other disciplines, you might find something similar uh, for occupational therapy, uh, that there'd be people writing from more radical or more critical perspectives attempting to have a look at what there might be within health systems that holds back the, uh, uh, the political aspirations of occupational therapists or the professional aspirations of occupational therapists or social workers. If you're seeing that kind uh, of purpose uh, evident within the studies that you're reading, what you're probably, probably therefore um, dealing with in those cases would be examples of critical ethnography. So let's turn now to characteristic features of methodology that we would expect to find in all forms of ethnographic research. Typically, ethnographies operate uh, on the basis of, uh, of, of field work as the basis to data collection, uh, and usually what you'll get is a combination of field observation and interviews. These often produce what are said to be thick descriptions, and I'll come back and say more about this presently. One of the typical approaches would be to identify and then to use key informants from the study settings, and usually these key informants would be picked um, on the basis of them being people who are influential within a particular service setting, within a particular clinical area, within a particular group of, of people. And then I'm also going to say something about what is often referred to as the imic etic debate, uh, and you can take those terms as meaning the insider-outsider debate, uh, and I'll say more about that presently and so won't elaborate in respect of this slide. So in terms of the basic methodological features, in ethnography, data collection uh, heavily relies on observation and interviews, and these can include participant or non-participant observation, so you might have a researcher um, that's moving through a particular research area. It could be a ward, it could be a community health centre, it could be out in an open area within a town or a city where this person or people are observing the health-related behaviours of groups of people and, and the health professional behaviours of groups of professional health service providers. They might be doing this from the point of view of just sitting there observing what's going on but attempting not to interact with whatever's happening around them, or in fact they might actually be participants in the sense that they're up and they're interacting with the nurses, doctors and allied health professionals and the, and the patients while at the same time collecting data. Interviews, and these can be, they can, these interviews can range from being fairly heavily structured through to being relatively unstructured, so there could be a well-developed uh, a, a set of questions in terms of an interview protocol or there might be one or two questions that would get an interview rolling and then really the intent would be to allow the people who are being interviewed, the participants, to simply say what they want to say. So where I've conducted those sorts of interviews, I might have started off uh, some research I've done looking uh, at issues surrounding um, working with clients who um, are diagnosed with what are often seen as, as difficult 
to manage problems such as borderline personality disorder. Uh, I once conducted a series of interviews with about 35 health professionals from across the various professions where I asked really one broad question which was, could you please tell me about your work with people with borderline personality disorder? And then really sat back and just allowed the person to tell me their story with a couple of prompts here and there and in most cases that easily generated up to an hour uh, of audio tape which then had to be transcribed and was very data rich. Um, so that's a very much a, a, an unstructured interview approach but I could just as easily have used a protocol where I asked a whole series of, of, of predetermined questions and solicited particular answers to particular questions from the participants. Um, in ethnographic research, as I said earlier, you can also um, add or augment uh, the data collection from observation and interviews with documentary evidence. These could include letters or diaries, policy documents, clinical notes, um, and a whole range of other documents that might be of interest to, uh, to the health professions uh, and to healthcare more generally. It can include audio taped oral histories. Examples might be um, if, for instance, um, you're wanting to capture the development of, uh, say, for instance, you might be interested in the development of occupational therapy from one generation to the next, and there are key informants who are close to retirement uh, or might already have retired, and you want to capture their views on, on what had happened in occupational therapy at an earlier stage and then perhaps their views about the transition to how occupational therapy or social work currently operates within Australian healthcare services, you might actually sit down and conduct a fairly detailed oral history asking this person to tell you about their story within the context of how they understand the history of occupational therapy to have unfolded within Australia or even internationally. And that can be a really, really important resource. If we don't capture that sort of data, there will come a time, of course, in which those key informants will no longer be available to be interviewed. Uh, and then it's a real tragedy if you lose that kind of oral history. You can have a, a loss of, if you like, uh, uh, of memory um, from the point of view of a particular profession. Uh, other sources might include newspapers uh, and media texts in terms of whether or not or how newspapers present um, key health-related issues. Um, so there have been extensive studies done looking at those sorts of, of issues and the extent to which people in the community learn what they know about health through sources such as newspapers and how reliable they are and the extent to which what is learned through those kinds of, of, of sources uh, would be in accord with the ways in which health professionals understand those very same health issues. And importantly, from a methodological point of view with ethnography, while we're looking for what happens in the ordinary everyday course of events, we're also very sensitive to trying to find or examples of the extraordinary, the unexpected, things that jumped out and really grabbed our attention um, that we weren't expecting to find. And I'll try and flesh both of those, the ordinary and the extraordinary, out a little more when I get down to the level of some specific examples in a little while. So, more on methodological features. I mentioned the term thick description. This was a term I think originally uh, used by Clifford Gertz, who is a, a very well-known um, uh, social scientist, mainly working within the field of anthropology, but some of his work spills across into sociology as well. And he used this term to convey the uh, level of detail necessary to put cultural and social patterns into cultural context. So uh, really the point here is, is that ethnographic data really only makes sense when it's understood in terms of a time, place and event um, from which the data is being collected. So if you're looking at uh, the cultural aspects of particular groups of people in particular places at particular times, what you're really dealing with here is an issue of localism versus universalism. It may well be that the culture of a particular set of allied health professionals or nurses or doctors uh, in a particular service setting, it might be a particular health service in one region, in a country such as, as Australia, might have aspects about it that are fairly unique, that might not be found in, the, in exactly the same way if you move to the next health service 
um, and, and, and in particular wouldn't be the same if you move, say, from New South Wales to Victoria, or indeed if you move from Australia to Canada or the United Kingdom. So one of the things we're very sensitive in relation to in ethnographic research is this whole issue about localism versus universalism. And broadly, ethnographers, I believe, are much more uh, likely to be focusing on what is found uh, in, in the local context from a cultural perspective. Usually cultures don't translate broadly to large social, uh, large social groupings. So when we talk of Australian healthcare, um, it can sometimes be very, very difficult to work out exactly what that is. There can be substantial differences in the way in which health professionals operate, not only from one state to the next, but from one hospital to the next, even in a city such as Sydney. Thick description is also about trying to understand how those being studied see themselves. Um, so the thoughts, feelings and perceptions that drive meaning making in a culture is very much at the heart of what ethnographers are attempting to try and identify or discern. So one of the things we would be setting out to do is to go back and to check out our interpretation of what is what we're seeing with those from, from who we are deriving that information. Sometimes the term that's used to describe these kinds of processes is member checking, where you go back, you've developed a particular interpretation, you go back to a group of your participants and you say, well, this is what I think I saw going on. How does this sound to you? Is this in accord with the way it feels to you? Does this sound like your experience of being a healthcare professional working in this particular health service? The identification and use of key informants and settings, I've already said purpose of sampling based on predetermined criteria that may be theory driven. The participants are much more like collaborators uh, and cultural or subcultural affiliation is, is important. Still with methodological features and addressing now uh, the emic ethic debate or as it is sometimes known the insider outsider debate. Really, the main purpose here is to try and strike a balance uh, between the frames of reference used by a researcher and the frames of reference used by the participants in a particular research project. What I mean by this is the outlooks, the expectations, the uh, prior beliefs, assumptions and experiences that the researcher brings to the research project, trying to strike uh, an effective balance between those that the researcher brings to the project against those which the participants have in terms of their participation within the project. So uh, the emic ethic debate being about insider and outsider perspectives uh, much depends um, on the relationship of the researcher to the phenomenon of interest. So let's, let's use an example. Uh, if uh, we were conducting a research within the discipline of occupational therapy, let's say, and let's say you were conducting this um, within a clinical setting or within a community center or, or, or a healthcare team in, in which you were actually employed or had been employed previously as an occupational therapist and you were collecting data from other people with whom you were familiar, they were familiar with you within the context of a service with which you were familiar, there would be aspects of the way in which you conduct the research which, which would certainly relate to insider perspectives, a person uh, really addressing the phenomenon of interest, but from within that phenomenon. You're actually part of the phenomenon that you're studying. However, if you're a researcher still within the discipline of occupational therapy and you take yourself off to a service that you've never been involved in, never been employed in, and you don't really know any of the other people, whether they be occupational therapists or other health professionals within that particular service and you conduct your research there, although there would be aspects, some aspects of an insider perspective because there would be shared cultural and professional beliefs within the broad profession of occupational therapy, um, in many ways you would be coming in as someone who is cold and not particularly familiar with what goes on in this particular service and the sorts of things that motivate the people who work within the service, the sorts of, if you like, the microcultures within that service. So there's some of the aspects that, that really we would be thinking of 
in, in respect of the insider, outsider, or imic uh, 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 etic um, uh, perspective. So imic equates with an insider perspective, etic uh, equates to an outsider perspective in relation to the thing being studied, the phenomenon of interest. Now, one of the risks here, of course, is that if you're um, uh, too caught up in an insider perspective, there is the risk of what sometimes is referred to as going native. In other words, allowing the views of those who work within the service to too heavily colour the interpretation you make of the data coming out of your research. It's important to take account of the views of those who are your informants, your participants, uh, the people who are telling you the way things are in relation to what it is that you're studying. But on the other hand, it's also important to be able to stand back and away from that and to put a little bit of distance between yourself as a researcher and that that you're researching and to try and, and form your own opinions about what you think might be going on because there may well be patterns of experience that you note that the people who are working within that thing that it is that you're studying might not realise themselves because they're too close to the circumstances they're involved in. Um, so again, if we hark back to what I have just said previously about um, being careful to strike a balance between insider and outsider perspectives, the risk of being too heavily influenced by an insider perspective would be the risk of going native, if you like. So achieving this balance is about, on one hand, listening for the legitimate and authentic voice of your participants, but on the other hand, also standing back and looking at that voice from a, a somewhat critical perspective and reflecting on your prior assumptions, your expectations, and the prior assumptions and expectations of those who are your participants, and to try and strike a balance between similarities and differences with respect to those sorts of considerations. What you'll sometimes see in the literature on ethnographic research is what are referred to as first and second order concepts. Um, and Denzen, Norman Denzen, who is a, a, a key uh, research methodologist in this field, in a number of his writings has developed this idea of first and second order concepts. And really he did this to try and differentiate between what, what are sometimes seen as common sense perspectives on everyday life and these would be first order concepts and usually this would be uh, directly emerging from the information your participants or informants are giving you. So people might use terms such as nervous breakdown and to try and make sense um, of what they think of as, as psychiatric problems. But when the researcher comes to try and understand these at a more abstract or theoretically driven level, um, you could certainly uh, hang on to the idea of nervous breakdown, but you know you would be wanting to deal with this at the second order conceptual level uh, as a form of clinical depression. So in a sense you're taking uh, the first order concept, the common, common sense informed concept, to a more abstract and theoretically informed level, uh, such as referring to nervous breakdown now as clinical depression, and this would be at the level of a second order concept. So, in terms of doing ethnographic field work, the process that's often followed would follow, uh, would follow on, uh, as you see in this particular slide. Initially, there would be a familiarisation with the group or the community to be investigated, and this is often referred to as becoming immersed in the field. Uh, sometimes the literature will refer to as a sort of an initial stage called a reconnaissance, where you go out there and make some preliminary observations, do some reading, talk to a couple of people about and try and form an idea of what you're likely to find when you get out in the field um, because this will help you then to design the study in a way that's going to maximise the effectiveness of the approach you're wanting to use. Then you have issues associated with entry into the field. How do you go about accessing the field? How do you go about making sure that you have been able to, uh, uh, to access people who will give you a full range of information about the phenomenon of interest. Seeking out multiple sources of data uh, and types of data. The identification of key informants. Searching for the obvious and the open and the not so obvious and open. That term serendipity is uh, very important. Often some of the 
most interesting and most important moments in qualitative research, and this is certainly true of ethnographic research, are things that were unexpected, and that's serendipity, something that just jumps out and surprises you. Um, an example of that from my own research quite some time ago, I, took, uh, I was involved in doing research with an acute mental health adult inpatient unit about a decade or so, so ago, and interestingly enough, it was in a unit that I'd been taking students into, student nurses into, for some time before I conducted the research in it. And it was only toward the end of a, an ethnographic research process that I discovered the, that the public telephone that was adjacent to the nurse's office in that particular ward was connected um, to a cut-off switch within the nurse's station. So that the nurses, it turned out, so I discovered, were fairly systematically listening in to what the sorts of conversations that their patients on the ward were having and if they didn't like the nature of the conversation they simply cut it off with uh, uh, no negotiation with the, uh, with the patient involved. Now, as you can imagine, uh, this was a, a fairly shocking discovery. Uh, uh, there were legal and ethical implications about what was happening. It turned out that this had been in place for something like a decade and had never been challenged within that health service previously. This was a totally unexpected finding uh, and one that has featured quite heavily in, in a number of the publications that I've produced that came out of that research. So that's a very good example of something that's serendipitous. I really didn't expect to find something like that, but I did. This idea of saturation, uh, this is to do with uh, at what point do you know uh, when you've collected sufficient data. Uh, in, in qualitative research, how do you determine whether you ought to be interviewing 10 informants or participants or 20 or 30 or 40? The answer is there's no easy way of knowing. So one of the approaches or concepts that's been developed for attempting to address this issue is the one of saturation. And saturation refers to a point at which you start hearing the same story coming back from multiple participants. In other words, you're not, you get to a stage where you're interviewing uh, your participants or your direct observations, you're not seeing much that's new, you're seeing a repeating story. That's referred to as data saturation. And then, of course, you've got issues around exiting from the field. If you've built up relationships with your informants uh, and they have expectations that you will go away, analyse this data, and perhaps at some point they will have the opportunity to hear back about the findings you've produced, it's important to make sure that there is clarity around that and that your expectations and the expectations um, of those who have participated in your study are clear and you follow through on them. And in fact, your ethical protocols in terms of gaining ethics approval um, will certainly uh, involve your having to answer certain questions about what your intentions are in terms of exiting the field um, uh, and making sure that uh, those who participated are happy and satisfied with the process they've been through they have no complaints, uh, and indeed if they have an interest in finding out what the outcomes of the study were, how they might go about doing that, and that usually all ought to be written up in a clear way, and they ought to, your participants ought to be informed about what those processes are and how they can access them. So in terms of the conduct um, of research, what is often produced from the various times, types of data collection is what often is referred to as an ethnographic research record. So if you look at this, and, and I've referred here on this slide to Spradley's typology, and you've got references there from two uh, highly regarded and often used uh, texts written by, by Spradley um, in 1979 and 1980 from which this typology is, uh, is derived. And what you've got here are different categories um, of field notes. So there's a condensed account, which is best thought of as a short description made in the field during data collection. Then an expanded account, usually uh, this is, uh, is, is filled in in much greater detail and usually done away from the field. So the researcher might carry a, a notebook whilst in the field. They might be in dot point or shorthand recording what's going on whilst they're actually in the field. But when they get back to their office or home, or somewhere else after they've left the study location, they would then sit down and expand in, in a separate book often in much greater detail to make sure that, that, that all the, the various nuances of what they were observing, what they were hearing, what was coming out of their interviews were all recorded in some degree of detail. 
There can also be a field work journal, which is the researcher's account of their own reactions, impressions, assumptions and problems during field work. I certainly use this, in some, have used these in some of my work, and as you might imagine in the incident I referred to a few, a few slides back about the uh, cut-off switch on the public telephone in the psychiatric unit I was conducting research in. I went home and filled in a couple of pages, um, which was almost a bit of a debriefing to do with how surprised I was that, one, this had been going on, but equally how surprised I was that this had been going on and I'd never found out about it previously. Um, and some of that certainly got into the write-up of the research um, at publication level later on. Uh, and analysis and interpretation of notes. Uh, this is the development of a progressive record of analysis and interpretive insights, concerns and associations. And this could be done in a separate book or notebook or sometimes the notebook within which you record an expanded account might be divided up or ruled up in such a way that, say, on the left-hand side of the page you have your longhand notes and then on the right-hand side of the page what you're doing is going through and starting to put in perhaps uh, analytical observations, linking some theory you've read in the literature to some of the field observations you've made and building this up on a continuous basis so that you're, what you're doing is, is bringing together at an initial level what you're seeing in the field, what you're hearing in the field with what you've been reading both prior to and during the conduct of the actual data collection itself. And again, to follow these up, those are articles by Spradley, although they're quite dated, they still are considered seminal approaches uh, and the more recent work in the field will usually use Spradley's work, uh, particularly these two publications, um, as key references. My suggestion would be you go back to the originals. Ethnographic analysis and interpretation. Having collected the data, how do you go about analysing and interpreting it? This of course commences at the very time which you're conducting the observations and interviews. So perhaps unlike quantitative research where typically you would go out and collect the data, then enter the data into uh, some sort of a uh, statistical analysis program and then conduct an analysis and then try and work out uh, or, or, or determine what comes out of that, what statistical patterns and what they might mean. Um, so in a sense the data collection comes first and then the analysis comes second. In typically in qualitative research, and of course the ethnographic work is no exception to that, um, the observations uh, and uh, inter the analysis and interpretation is happening from the very moment you start the data collection. There's a constant revisiting of research questions. Uh, really it's a good idea every day where you're going out in the field to just refer back to research questions and remind yourself about what it is that you're primarily interested in really as a bit of a safety check to make sure that you're not drifting off the main purpose of the study. Then there are issues surrounding the ordering and organisation of data, so sort of data management in, in a qualitative research sense, uh, how you write it up, how you manage it, and that really harks back to the previous slide in terms of the various ways in which you might record field notes and then combine them with your theoretical um, uh, 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 learnings that have come out of your, your reading of the literature, for instance. One of the things that is really important in ethnographic research and in any form of qualitative research is to immerse yourself in the data, so reading, rereading, and then re-re-reading, interview transcripts, field notes, documents, going back and really immersing yourself in what is in there. And then trying to arrange data in manageable chunks. Um, I learned long ago that, that if you've got a 35-page interview transcript and you're just going through it line by line, page after page, you can sometimes get lost just in the length of the transcript. So what I tend to do nowadays is I tend to cut each A4 page up of transcript up into three equal-sized pieces and I number them so they can be reassembled. And I tend to look at the one-third A4 page chunks individually, if you like, uh, either on a computer screen or in hard copy in pieces of paper. And I look at what's going on in each of those and form my conclusions initially at that level and then reassemble it to try and build up an interpretive picture from that. Because I found in the early days I was just getting lost in the length uh, and the amount of information that was in the transcripts. And of course, 
analysis and interpretation is very much about building up, comparing and contrasting categories. So typically what you would do would be, be going through the observational data uh, or, or interview transcripts and trying to pull out key themes. Um, so to, again, to go back to the example I've been using throughout, um, if you're looking for evidence of ways in which nurses by, might be resisting medical dominance, um, what actual clinical practices might you observe where you think this is what the nurses are doing? Um, you know, if they're getting medical orders, for instance, and they don't like those medical orders, what might they do that could be considered to be examples of resistance? Might they partially implement them, accidentally, inverted commas, lose them, um, delay carrying out the doctor's orders? Um, just, just bits and pieces of information that you might build up and say, well, these look to me as if they could be evidence of what we might think of as nursing resistance to medical dominance and see whether or not they fit what other work has said nursing resistance to medical dominance might look like and whether it fits the theory that might be in the literature as well. So it's the building up, comparing and contrasting of categories or themes. Searching for relationships between categories. Identification and description of patterns and themes again along the lines of what I've been talking about. And of course, once you've got your various descriptive categories and you're starting to look at relationships between these categories, what does it all mean? And that's the broad, the highest level, if you like, in ethnographic research, the interpretive level. And hopefully this will be clearer um, when I get to some of the specific examples of ethnographic research in a moment. So, this is where we now start to move into some specific examples of research to try and flesh out what we've been dealing with largely at the theory and methodological level so far. So, some ethnographic research questions. Here's an example of, a, of an ethnographic research section, a research question from an actual study conducted by a psychiatrist and his research colleagues um, about three or four years ago and reported in the Australian New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry and the references for this are in the reference list at the end of this presentation. And the question that drove this study is how is the symbolism of community understood and practiced in a mental health crisis and assessment service in an Australian city? And this study, to address that research question, the study used fieldwork techniques for data collection and ethnographic data analysis. And what it found at the analysis and level of interpretation was as evidenced uh, in this study that in mental health practice the idea of community is nearly always equated as being good and is generally defined in contradistinction to hospital which is nearly always seen as bad. So it's good to have people in the community, it's bad to have to put people into hospital. But there are also counter narratives that nostalgically evo evoke older positive images of asylum. Um, and the idea here is that the term which is often used perjuratively these days, or the meanings that are often used for asylum these days, are perjurative meanings. You know, in other words, uncaring mass institutions where people are locked up and forgotten about. But the original meaning of the term asylum was a place where one could actually go to have peace and quiet, to be removed from the stresses and strains of life for a period of time, to try and regain their emotional composure, if you like and that sometimes there is some evidence from the work conducted for this particular study that some of those older counter-narratives are also being evoked. Uh, so that whilst most of the people giving information to the study tended to think of community as good, community mental health as superior to mental health conducted in a hospital, um, there were some who said that there were older meanings um, around asylum that ought not to be forgotten that, and therefore that hospitals actually have a valuable, will continue to have a valuable and important place in mental health care uh, in, in continuing on into the 21st century. Ideal patient types emerge from this community hospital binary, this playing off of community and hospital meanings um, that play into strategic decisions that staff make regarding which patients stay in the community. So those who are not so disturbed not seen to be dangerous, um, uh, where those who are seen uh, to be more dangerous would go to hospital, um, for instance. So, in other words, in, in the community the idea is that uh, those who are not going to be so troublesome will not cause that much as much difficulty, wouldn't be seen as dangerous, 
possibly are going to be seen as much more likely to respond effectively to treatment are likely to be ideal types of patients to be cared for in the community, whereas those who ought to go to hospital are those who are troublesome, resistant to treatment, uh, not likely to follow uh, medical orders, uh, and so on and so forth. So again, you get this, um, this playing out of, uh, of binary ideas, um, uh, community good, hospital bad, um, ideal types of patients who ought to be treated in the community, difficult types of patients who ought to be treated in hospitals. And according to this study, the symbolism inherent in the idea of community being good, hospital being bad, and the linkages between those good and bad meanings and, and, uh, and compliant versus difficult patients um, were really quite important considerations uh, as indicated through this study. Another ethnographic research um, study, this is one I was involved in, in fact it's one I referred to earlier. And the research question there was what meanings do health professional staff assign to people with borderline personality disorder prior to and following training in dialectical behaviour therapy? And this was written up and published uh, in 2006 and again the reference is included at the end of the presentation. Uh, and basically we um, conducted uh, individual interviews and then a series of focus groups with around about 40 health professionals from all of the major mental health disciplines, psychiatry, um, uh, career medical officers, mental health nurses and allied health professionals. And when we looked at the, uh, the data, what came out of it really was that at the stage before most of these health professionals had undertaken formal training in dialectical behaviour therapy, their views of working with people um, who had borderline personality disorder was that largely they were very difficult clients to a very large extent. Um, they were untreatable and to a very large extent we lacked having effective treatments. So it was a very pessimistic uh, outlook, if you like, prior to having done the, uh, uh, the training in dialectical behaviour therapy. After having done the training in dialectical behaviour therapy, however, there was quite a significant change in a positive direction and overwhelmingly what we were now seeing were optimistic outlooks in which what were previously seen to be a lack of effective treatments, uh, people were now saying, well, we do have effective treatments. There's certainly dialectical behaviour therapy, but there are others as well from an evidence-based perspective. So people were much more open to the possibility that perhaps this uh, disorder was manageable and was treatable. Um, but also, interestingly, people started to see ways in which the training in dialectical behaviour therapy would actually assist their own personal and professional development. Um, so some aspects of what they'd learned, particularly some of the mindfulness training and, and some of the skills around distress tolerance, bearing in mind that working with what are perceived to be difficult groups of clients can be distressing, and in a cognitive behaviour theory uh, therapy approach, which is, uh, incorporates fairly heavily distress tolerance strategies for clients that staff can use these to assist themselves to better work with people who otherwise would uh, usually cause them to feel distressed. Um, so we saw much more optimistic and positive outlooks in the post-training period where after people had undertaken uh, this research. And again, that was all conducted using ethnographic methods. I wouldn't say this was ne necessarily a piece of ethnography, but we certainly used ethnographic field uh, work methods um, and to some extent analyse the data using ethnographic methods. And this is a, a, another one. This relates back to the issue about uh, nursing resistance to medical dominance. The question here was how do nurses think, act and reflect on their clinical nursing practice? This is a study uh, really undertaken by Annette Street which is now considered a classic within the nursing literature. And in this street collaborated with four nurses in, the, in an Australian acute care hospital in the late 1980s. She collected descriptive accounts of what it was that nurses were doing in the clinical areas of that hospital on a day-to-day -day basis over about a six-month period. And when she was anal analysed this data, what she was wanting to do was to try and highlight, highlight what you might think of as penetrations and limitations inherent in the nurses' brushes with medical dominance and how this shaped the expectations of what nurses could or could not do. Now the idea of penetrations was these are partial insights into the ways in which nurses 
might deal with what they thought they saw or were seeing uh, as a degree of doctor interference with the work of nurses, how they could deal with that in a way that would enable them to perhaps pursue at least partially what it was they wanted to be able to achieve clinically. The limitation side of it are those things or impediments that stop the nurses from being able to fully pursue their aspirations in terms of effectively dealing with doctor dominance, if you like. So uh, this balance between penetrations and limitations was really at the heart uh, of, of, uh, of Street's analysis of the data that she derived in this study. This is a good example of a study, of a cri critical ethnographic study. It clearly has an open ideological intent. The aim there is to assist in the emancipation or the freeing of nurses from the limitations of medical dominance. Street states that very clearly in the book in which he uh, describes this research. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, a decade or so afterwards, Deirdre Wicks went back and she studied nurses and doctors at work. And her aim, her study, whereas Street set out to try and identify the processes by which nurses, nursing work tends to be supervised uh, or directed uh, more or less extensively by doctors, Street uh, uh, Wicks went out, Deirdre Wicks set out to try and demonstrate that in fact the extent of nursing resistance to medical dominance was great, much, much greater than what Street and others had argued it was. So uh, Wicks set out to explicitly try and identify that nurses in fact are very, very good at subverting or undermining um, doctor dominance or medical dominance and of course in her study and again the references for both of these in the reference list at the end of the presentation uh, she was able to actually demonstrate many many instances uh, or provide much evidence where this was happening from her own clinical or, or direct field observations within clinical um, settings uh, also within an Australian hospital. So whereas Street set out to explicitly identify evidence of the medical dominance over nursing. Wick set out to explicitly find evidence of the resistance to medical dominance and interestingly enough they both found it. So perhaps uh, one of the lessons here is that what you go looking for very much structures what you will probably find um, and the nature of the research question can certainly significantly influence the nature of the evidence that is likely to be turned up. This is another uh, study. In fact, uh, this is from my, um, my doctoral thesis um, completed uh, uh, in um, uh, 1992. How do mental health workers deal with and manage the health reform inherent in the national mental health policy? And what I did in that study was I conducted field work, a combination of participant observation, focus interviews, documentary evidence with 18 participants from a regionally located adult acute mental health inpatient service um, from another part of Australia. I didn't undertake this research in New South Wales. And I used critical ethnography and, discourse, and a combination of discourse analysis. Um, and the findings of that were that participants generally ideologically re-articulated progressive meanings in the national mental health policy and use these as the basis to undermining management attempts to implement the policy. Uh, and this was really a case study in how it is that health professionals, in this case nurses mainly, but some allied health professionals and some doctors, um, enact policy rather than simply resistant. So what I meant by that was I, saw, I, I identified many, many examples where, uh, for instance, the nurses might be talking about um, uh, well, they stopped talking about mental health patients and started talking about mental health consumers, which was very uh, within the course of conducting this research, which was very consistent with the policy language of the National Mental Health Policy in the early 1990s, as it still is up until today. But then when you look at the way they interacted with their consumers, they are interacting with them very much as if they were still um, uh, traditional psychiatric patients, if you like. So although the right terms, the politically correct terms such as consumer were being used, it appeared not to really have had much of a positive impact on the nature of the interactions which uh, the nurses and some of the other health professional staff were having with those 
uh, under their care. So in that sense, um, it was highlighting real limitations in terms of the extent to which the national mental health policy was flowing through to have a positive impact on the way in which uh, the enterprise of providing mental health care was being undertaken at least within the, th the first three or four years of the national mental health strategy in the early 1990s. And uh, getting very close to the end of the presentation now, but I'm aware that many of you, perhaps the majority of you, um, doing this course will be coming from a background other than my disciplinary background. So here's an example of the use of, of ethnographic methods um, within the discipline of occupational therapy. This would be considered more an example of a conventional ethnography. I don't think there is a particular ideological intent in this, but it would be interesting to debate that. You, you might argue that attempting to better understand the circumstances of parents um, who have children with a chronic medical condition where you're seeking to bring about better care um, and support for those people actually does have an ideological intent as well as a clinical improvement intent. That's something you might want to discuss perhaps in, a, in your email discussions within the course. But the question driving this study was how do parents of children with a chronic medical condition manage the demands of caregiving? Um, the method here uh, used data collection uh, graduate students were used to collect data from eight patients of children with chronic medical conditions over 60 hours of activities over about a six month time frame uh, and uh, the kinds of chronic conditions that are, are represented uh, were uh, cerebral palsy, um, congenital heart defect, uh, uh, blindness, uh, gastronomy, uh, gastrostomy, um, severe forms of brain injury, so really quite profoundly disabling conditions. Um, and the data collection sources, in-depth interviews with parents and extended observations of families, field notes on family outings and other activities, journal entries bringing together insights from the field and those from reading the literature, uh, and it's important to note that the training project coordinator was a mother of a child with cerebral palsy. So, you know, you might want to uh, think about the implications of having a project coordinator with that kind of background themselves from the point of view of the insider-outsider debate. Uh, might that have posed a threat to the study or might it have actually represented a strength within the study design? Um, I think you could, you could make arguments from either direction to a certain extent, but it's certainly something that I think we, you would benefit from if you uh, read this article uh, in some detail, if you're able to access it and read it, and think about the implications from the insider-outsider debate uh, about the, uh, uh, the background of the training project coordinator. There you have the reference uh, from uh, Kay Smith, and that's uh, accessible from the American Journal of Occupational Therapy from 2004. So uh, in terms of the uh, analysis of, of the data that was generated, uh, a number of broad themes were generated. One was caregiving, another was family social lives, and also family self-identity. So if you like, these were the lines or trajectories of impact um, upon um, the families from the, um, uh, from the point of view of parenting. And under the caregiving category, uh, the sub-themes included the challenges of always being there. You know, parenting really represented a 24-7 situation uh, which placed great demands uh, and, and great uh, stresses, if you like, great challenges uh, upon uh, the parents. Um, in in there were instances certainly where it caused a rethink of career planning, um, uh, given that, that, that people were going to be, uh, there was going to be a heavy call um, on, on the parent's time uh, and of course often in terms of decision making uh, about what was going to be best for the child, best for the parents, best for the family, it was really about uh, 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 combinations of ongoing compromises uh, if you like. Um, from the point of view of the, the social lives of the families involved, uh, day-to-day -day issues such as where do I find a babysitter, the opportunity to be able to spend some time a way to be able to pursue um, the other sides of family life, I suppose, uh, you know, the, uh, the husband and wife aspects of, uh, of having time together 
um, even if these were minimum amounts of time so that the, that, that the parents were not drawn 100% of time into the, uh, 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 the carer role and some of the impact and implications that can follow on from that. And of course an important theme was anticipating the unanticipated. As you might imagine um, from the point of view uh, of uh, parenting a child with a chronic medical condition, there must be and were many, many instances where the unexpected came up uh, and had to be dealt with. So business as usual uh, may well turn out to be anticipating the unanticipated. From the, the point of view of family self-identity, how does a, a family identify and, and derive strength out of what for many would be very difficult, very threatening circumstances? And the themes there were celebrating life. Um, that, that, that some of the data coming out of this study suggested that far from being a negative, often the, uh, the outcome of, of, of the parenting experience was to celebrate life, to gain strength, um, to draw closer together. For instance, often uh, forged through adversity initially, but often people were able to find great positives through that process as well. And of course I suppose the, and this is where maybe the political intent might be part of it, was the, the drift toward becoming an advocate, to speak up not only on behalf of the loved one who has the chronic disease, but perhaps others who do, and perhaps on behalf of carers who face similar sorts of challenges and becoming more politically active as well. So the whole uh, uptake of an advocacy role uh, was very much an important theme coming out of, of this study as, as well. So in terms of broad conclusions, putting all that together, what the study basically uh, produced were at the interpretive level was that although the parents expressed stresses related to coping with the caregiving uh, burden or load, they viewed having a child with a chronic medical condition as, as a generally positive experience, experience that brought really great cohesion to their family. The parents explained that their experiences with their children helped them to appreciate life and develop more sensitivity to and tolerance of individual differences. The parents had become strong advocates for their children and other children with similar needs. It's a study I think that um, you, would, you would find very, very interesting to read, both in terms of what it teaches us about uh, the experience of being a parent in those sorts of circumstances, but also from the point of view um, of being an example of, of the use of ethnography uh, for clinical purposes. Uh, and the final comment here is that one of the things, and I haven't talked about this previously, but if you look at this in the context of the Case Smith paper that we've been talking about for the last few slides, uh, authenticity uh, of the analysis and interpretation of a qualitative study is really the equivalent of concerns surrounding validity and reliability um, in a quantitative study. So in terms of interpretation, the sorts of things that might be undertaken to ensure the authenticity or, or, or the validity of your findings in a qualitative study would relate to the literature review that you've read, how rigorous and comprehensive was it, reflection on, um, on the literature that you've read and also reflection on, the, um, on what's in the literature and how what's in the literature compares with what has come out of the research that has been conducted in this case with, with the families, uh, the parents that were involved. In this case, two mothers from the study were also engaged to review themes to provide member checks and validate findings. You remember earlier I referred to this idea of taking your interpretation back to some of the participants, running it past them and seeing whether or not they get what your interpretation has been, whether it sounds authentic or real to them in terms of their experience um, and the feedback they give you on that, uh, if you like. And this is a means to validating your developing findings so that you have confidence that what you have picked up really has a high degree of authenticity about it. And in addition to that, two graduate students and three academic staff on the project served as peer reviewers. So as the researcher was going through and undertaking the data collection and interpretation, they also engaged uh, several graduate students and, and academic colleagues to go through and to provide feedback and comment, again by way of authenticating the developing uh, data analysis and interpretation. So um, again, I'll, I'll leave you 
to decide whether you think that that is a rigorous approach. Um, you, you might consider whether this constitutes uh, uh, the equivalent uh, of, of uh, activities that would be similar to validity and reliability testing within quantitative research. You might think about something like an audit trail that has been undertaken um, to demonstrate um, how the findings of a study such as this were arrived at and whether another group of researchers following the description that's in the published report of the, uh, of the study in the American Journal of Occupational Therapy is the description of the study from the point of view of an audit trail clear enough so that other researchers could conduct a similar study um, uh, uh, or, or in other words to replicate it. These are important considerations in terms of authenticity. Finally, um, for those of you who are, if anyone is particularly taken by ethnographic research and you'd like to read some very, very classic examples of ethnographic research that are out there in the literature, uh, a very famous Australian study, Bradstow, a study of status, class and power in a small Australian town, undertaken in the, uh, the very early 1970s. Bradstow is an actual place in, uh, in Australia. Um, it's uh, a town in New South Wales. Um, I won't tell you which town, it is widely known which it is, um, and if you looked up Bradstow you would probably find some of the newspaper reports published soon after the publishing of the study, which unfortunately and embarrassingly for the researcher identified what the actual town was. Bradstow was, uh, was not the real name of the town. Um, but this was a study of status, class and power in a small Australian town, and this researcher went and actually lived there for about 18 months. Um, and on a day-to-day -day basis attended council meetings, wandered around the town, joined various social clubs, interviewed a lot of the locals, and wanted to try and build up a, uh, an ethnographic uh, profile of how decision-making at, at the political level operated within this town. And you might imagine that uh, the decisions at council were basically made through a formal council process. What Wilde was able to demonstrate in this study was that whilst there was an official um, seal of approval put on to many of the decisions, say, through a council meeting. Most of the, uh, the work had been done behind the scenes by a relatively small group of highly influential families and power brokers in key businesses and, and key influential family groups. And a lot of the argy-bargy or the uh, negotiating around what were later rubber-stamped as council decisions um, were actually carried out in places like the, uh, the better of the two golf clubs or the pony club and places like that. Um, so that power was really operating much more influentially at an informal level and then being rubber stamped um, a little while afterwards at the formal level. So this is a classic study of its type undertaken in an Australian town. Uh, and Willis's study is a, a classic example. A uh, wild study, by the way, I should point out, would be considered a classic study of a conventional ethnography. Willis's study, Learning to Labour, would be considered one of the earliest, but still one of the most classic examples of a critical ethnographic study. It's critical because uh, Willis's ideological intent was to try and demonstrate that young working class lads in uh, the Britain of Margaret Thatcher's period of Prime Minister were actually being set up for a life in factories by the failure of the, of, of, of the schooling system that basically was um, already writing off working class lads and not really giving them much of an opportunity to be able to better themselves at the very point at which they were at school. So rather than helping them to better themselves, it was actually setting them up to produce them for a life of factory toil and labour, if you like. That was his ideological intent. Um, which, in, in my view, was largely well demonstrated within the book. Basically what he did is he um, followed a group of, of a dozen or so working class lads in Birmingham in Britain in the mid-1970s, following them for the last year of their schooling, where they were about 15 or 16 years of age, and then across into the first year of, of their time in the workforce, where they were pretty well all working in labouring jobs, uh, and then started really using this idea of penetrations and limitations that I mentioned earlier in respect of um, streets, uh, critical ethnography of nursing, to try and demonstrate how it was that whilst these young working class, British working class lads had some insights into the way um, in which their behaviour at school was likely to impact upon their employability or their ability to get good jobs 
in the labour force after they leave school, um, these were more than overtaken by the limiting factors which really set them up for a, for a life of factory work. So in many ways a very st sad but nevertheless a very classic study uh, and well worth a read from the point of view of a classic instance of a, um, of a, a critical ethnography. Well, that really is everything I wanted to say in this lecture, so hopefully it's provided a broad introduction to critical ethnography. Hopefully um, it's uh, raised some interest for you. Uh, there are the references um, that I have mentioned. Uh, there are one or two not mentioned there that are actually identified on specific slides uh, throughout the lecture itself. Um, I do hope you found it interesting. Uh, this is the first time I've recorded it. Uh, in this way, so uh, if any of you do have feedback you'd like to provide about the uh, uh, the way in which uh, I've done a voice over in respect of a PowerPoint presentation, I'd be uh, very happy if you were wanting to um, send that feedback back through the course coordinators back to me in due course so that the uh, when we revise this lecture and, and next provide it, that would be for the 2011 academic year that I would have the benefit of some of your feedback. I'll be doing also the lecture on grounded theory with, with you, which is next week's lecture, um, and I look forward to presenting that to you then. Thank you very much.